In March 2022, Jehovah's Witnesses produced an 837-page document explaining to governments the organization's practice of shunning, or as they would call it, disfellowshipping. Jehovah's Witnesses recently lost government funding in Norway, largely due to their disfellowshipping arrangement, as they call it, being deemed a violation of human rights and Watchtower are eager to change that. This then is self-described reference material, ostensibly an attempt to explain in simple terms to lay people how their internal shunning process works and why it is not, contrary to what the Norwegian government and critics of the organization say, cruel, unusual, unfair, or a human rights violation. The authorities in Norway have threatened to remove our legal registration because of our scriptural beliefs and practices regarding disfellowshipping. And to give you a sense of what we're dealing with here, let's take a look at the opening words of the document. Jehovah's Witnesses respect the right of every individual to decide what religious beliefs he or she may have, if any. Similarly, each individual has a right to change his religion should he or she decide to do so. We do not force our beliefs on anyone. The decision to be baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses is entirely voluntary, conditional on the person meeting basic scriptural requirements. The document itself is obviously very, very long, which is partly why this video took so long to make. But there is remarkably little new argumentation from Watchtower produced for this document. The majority of the work is repurposed material from existing Jehovah's Witness publications. There is a pre-existing brochure that Watchtower evidently had previously prepared for governments and other legal entities, and the brochure itself is full of excerpts which will go on to be cited by Watchtower elsewhere in the document. There are long passages simply copied and pasted, at times a bit crudely, from old Watchtower publications and internal manuals, and hundreds of pages are simply wholesale reproductions of court records and existing works of alleged scholarship on the religion. And the document is, to put it bluntly, full of lies. Misinformation, yes. Misdirection, yes. Rhetorical trickery, yes. But also, just lies to trick the court system you know, like a crime. So how are we going to go about debunking over 800 pages of lies and misinformation? We're going to break it up into three sections. The new material written specifically for this document, the included shunning brochure, which to my knowledge had never been previously released to the wider public, and thirdly, the so-described experts cited who defend Jehovah's Witnesses' disfellowshipping practice. Before we get into the nitty-gritty, though, we need to remember a simple truth, which is that it takes much longer to refute a lie than it does to tell a lie. This is probably an obvious point, but I have a feeling some Watchtower apologists may take a peek at this video, and one of their bones of contention may be that I don't go over each and every word of it in my rebuttal. So as an example, I'm going to make a simple statement, the moon is made of green cheese. That took me one second to say, but if you wanted to refute that statement, you'd have to explain why I'm wrong. So after doing your research, which you're a little resentful of having to do in the first place, because even though you don't know exactly what the moon is made of, you're pretty sure it's not cheese. You come up with this. There have been expeditions to the moon, and geological samples of the rock that have been collected and studied show that the average composition of the lunar surface by weight is roughly 43% oxygen, 20% silicone, 19% magnesium, 10% iron, 3% calcium, 3%... You get it. My simple one-second mistruth took about 10 times as long to rebut. And that's before I come back at you with... Yeah, but how do we know the moon landing even happened? This document is full of what I'm going to call green cheese arguments. Small, false assertions that aren't hard to debunk in and of themselves besides the overwhelming volume of them. Let's go back to the first paragraph, for example. Do Jehovah's Witnesses respect the right of each individual to decide their own religious beliefs? Well, since the entire concept of disfellowshipping is being questioned at the moment, let's leave aside the fact that if a JW decides to join another religion, they will be disfellowshipped and thus cut off from their JW friends and family, which some would argue is not very respectful at all, but we're leaving that aside. Allegedly shunned, I should say. Let's talk about the fact that they classify every other religion on Earth as false religion, which is directly controlled by Satan the Devil, and which will be violently destroyed in Armageddon. One of their study publications says, False religion is like false money. It may look like the real thing, but it is worthless. So, all other faiths are worthless. Just a nice, respectful statement there. And they also refer to every other religion as a collective prostitute or great harlot, saying, How happy mankind can be that Jehovah's judgment upon the great harlot is at hand. May it soon be executed. Nice. Why is comparing false religion to a prostitute an effective illustration? Now, are individual witnesses generally kind and respectful to people of other religions? Of course, the same way we'd expect anyone to be kind and respectful to someone of another faith. But some would argue calling those who disagree with you satanic puppets who serve an evil demon and are doomed to destruction and also, yay, we can't wait for that destruction, it's going to be so great when every religion other than my own is destroyed, 
a little disrespectful. Do Jehovah's Witnesses force their beliefs on people? Well, what do we mean by force? Witness children are told that becoming a witness is the only way to make God happy, that baptism is a requirement for salvation, and if they don't get baptized, they may well not be saved at Armageddon. Governing body members have given direct instruction to parents to withhold certain freedoms until the child gets baptized. And your young ones, uh, we've been entreating you, you gotta get that clear. Especially as you get older, the only way you're getting through this storm, the great one, is your relationship with God, your personal relationship, just like everybody else. Unless you're a toddler, and we know how Jehovah sanctify them, but as you get older, you are responsible. Remember the nice demo? We've mentioned that before. Well, I'm not ready to get baptized. Okay, let's hold off on your driver's license. What? I'm 16, what are you talking about? I'm ready, I know I'm ready. Yeah, you're ready for a driver's license, but you're not ready to dedicate your life. Hmm. Explain that one to heaven. Baptism is framed as a choice between everlasting life in the truth or everlasting destruction in Satan's doomed system of things. And why would a Jehovah's Witness parent raise their child to possibly examine options other than getting baptized as a witness? We just established what all those other religions are like and what's going to happen to them. So, are witness children forcibly held down underwater? No, but it's not really voluntary if God or your parents are pointing an Armageddon gun at your head. And with all that, we've successfully made it through the first two sentences of the first page of 800 pages. Now, thankfully, I'm not wasting your time. Intentionally, anyway. See, we've successfully demonstrated a couple things here. Watchtower is not being fully transparent. They are willing to bend the truth to appear more moderate than they really are if it benefits them. And we've demonstrated the sort of environment Jehovah's Witness children are raised in. And that's going to be critical to our understanding of shunning and why Watchtower's depiction of it in this document is grossly untrue. So instead of going line by line, we're going to go claim by claim, address the larger claims made throughout the document, and hopefully in this way address the majority of Watchtower's green cheese arguments. Claim 1. Anyone who joins Jehovah's witnesses does so knowing what the disfellowshipping arrangement entails. They are entering into a contract that they understand, so they can't go around and complain after they get shunned. So how does Watchtower demonstrate this in the shunning document? To be considered a Jehovah's Witness, you must be baptized, and, as it says, they believe that people should be free to acquire knowledge so that they may make an informed decision. That is why Jehovah's Witnesses do not practice infant baptism and confer baptism only to a mature individual who has the capacity to understand his religious commitment. A person who qualifies for baptism as one of Jehovah's Witnesses is made fully aware that violating certain biblical standards without repentance may, in some cases, result in their expulsion, disfellowshipping, or disassociation. Anyone who does not agree with these teachings can simply choose to not be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So. Is this true? Is a person who qualifies for baptism as one of Jehovah's Witnesses made fully aware of these things? And is it really the case that someone who does not agree with these teachings can simply choose not to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses? The answer to both is no. First, we need to discuss the misleading claims regarding baptism. Watchtower says, unlike other churches, they do not baptize infants, conferring baptism only to a mature individual who has the capacity to understand his religious commitment. Here's an article on JW.org showing an eight-year-old child getting baptized. This is one of the mature individuals Watchtower mentioned, entering a lifelong contract with a religion that has built-in penalties for ever leaving. Now, can an eight-year-old sign a legal document? Can an eight-year-old consent to a medical procedure without a parent or guardian? Here's a good one. Can an eight-year-old consent to sex or marriage? Absolutely not, obviously. Maybe some areas of the world have some workaround that allows for an eight-year-old to get married with a parent's consent or something, but hopefully we all agree that that would be immoral and wrong. Moreover, I'm sure Watchtower would say that that's immoral and wrong and would probably be insulted at any implication that they support it. And they don't, as far as I know. But Watchtower routinely refers to baptism as a lifelong commitment even more important than marriage. This is the example they use for kids. It is literally in a book called Young People Ask. So Watchtower feels that young children children are mature enough individuals to understand the lifelong commitment to something that is even more important than marriage. In my own wedding, the elder giving the wedding talk told me and my wife that this was the second most important dedication of our lives. 
the first being baptism. And without even getting into cognitive development, clearly allowing a child to enter a lifelong commitment to a religion precludes the possibility of them ever changing their mind. Because sometimes, when you're a kid, you think you want to do something, and later, with some perspective, you realize you don't want to do that thing anymore. Galaxy brain take, I know. What Watchtower does not give its members of any age is informed consent. You'll notice that Watchtower keeps referring to disfellowshipping as something that happens when a sinner does not repent, or to an unrepentant person. I can only speak from my own experience in the religion, but when I heard statements to that effect as a kid and got baptized at the age of 14, I thought, well, of course I'll always repent, so why would I ever get disfellowshipped? The wording in this document makes it sound even more rare and unlikely. If you're repentant, you may, in some cases, be disfellowshipped. But Watchtower does not provide its non-elder members with its internal elders manual, which has rules, policies, and procedures that the average rank-and-file member has no way of knowing. It's not enough to be repentant. In a judicial committee, the elders must subjectively decide whether you appear repentant enough. And if it's not your first offense, say you're a teenager who gets caught watching pornography several times despite counsel from the elders, well, the elders might decide that the mere fact that you've sinned more than once shows that you are not repentant. Some things, such as fornication, are basically automatic disfellowshipping offenses, regardless of how repentant the sinner is. It has even been the case where a victim of rape has been disfellowshipped for sexual immorality, thus blaming the rape on the victim herself. It's even been the case that the disfellowshipped victim is a teenager. Some of the court cases Watchtower has been trying to weasel their way out of lately have involved this exact scenario. So it has been, and continues to be the case, that a Jehovah's Witness child can enter into a lifelong commitment they can't possibly understand because A, they're raised in a closed community that demonizes the outside world, B, because Watchtower doesn't make all the information available to everyone, and C, because Watchtower firmly does not believe that people should be free to acquire knowledge so that they may make an informed choice. Well, okay, maybe in a general legal sense, yes, but how does Watchtower, in its publications and videos, categorize outside information about its religion? Does Watchtower recommend Bible students or witness children research criticisms of the religion? Maybe from religious scholars, former members, historians? high control group experts? Well, no. What do you think I need to do to change? How about we search for Good for Building Up from the online library? Sounds good. Let's take a look. So far, I've specifically talked about people who are born into the religion. But what about converts? People who Jehovah's Witnesses meet in the ministry, that person studies with witnesses for a while, and gets baptized as an adult. Well, early on in a Bible studies... Uh, Bible study, they will be told that because they're trying to serve Jehovah, Satan will attack them even harder with fake news, pressure from family members, and co-workers to stop studying. In talks and video materials, the leaders will broadly assert that lies are being spread about them online in the media from demonically influenced apostates. Today, Satan continues his work as an evil ventriloquist using not serpents, but human puppets to enunciate his voice these acting as his agents, either wittingly or unwittingly. Today, rumors are occasionally being spread in electronic form about the faithful slave. This has caused some concern on the part of some brothers, especially when the reports are commenting on court cases where some in the organization were accused. Sometimes reference is made to certain quotes, and readers then think, how can a quote be a rumor? A quote can be taken out of context. Critical reports often give only part of a matter and leave out other aspects. So don't trust that Satan-y stuff. Only trust JW.org, articles that portray the witnesses in a positive light, and just try to focus on how nice everyone is at the meeting. And uh, I want you to get really acquainted with the organization. And if you do, I'm sure you'll soon realize that what the people are saying about us isn't true. If a Bible student comes across a critical article about Watchtower and tries to ask their JW Bible teacher for an explanation, the witness teacher is directed to not even read the article themselves to determine whether or not it's true. Consider this scenario. The unbelieving husband of your Bible student sends his wife a link to an apostate webpage and says, here, you better look at this and see what you're getting into. Well, your student is concerned she wants you to take a look and tell her what you think. 
Well, that's not an option. To cite my own experience, when I got baptized at the age of 14, I did not have any close non-JW friends because I wasn't allowed. They were considered bad association. So, Sophia, what do you think Jehovah is teaching you about friendship? That I have to choose my friends carefully. And how can you know if someone should be your friend? If they help me be Jehovah's friend. I did not know many of the earnest criticisms of the organization's policy on blood transfusions. I did not know of Watchtower's many failed doomsday predictions. In fact, I couldn't have known that because Watchtower has made certain publications unavailable to members, especially those that contradict their current beliefs. I did not know about the CSA scandals and cover-ups, and even if I'd heard about them, I have been trained to dismiss them as apostate-driven lies. Think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's Organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? I did not fully understand at that point that I myself was bisexual and that constantly being exposed to homophobic rhetoric would be a source of deep self-hatred, shame, and anxiety. I didn't know that if a trans person wants to join the religion, they would be forced to detransition before joining. Critically, I didn't know anything about high control groups or how they work. Through a combination of isolation and fear, I had limited access to outside information, and even if I had these resources, I had been raised to disregard critical information as lies or maliciously biased. Besides, where else would I go? We all know there must be one true religion, and all the other ones are going to be destroyed any day now. Eventually, I just decided for myself, I don't want to be a part of this religion anymore. Now, did I have a right to change my religion? Well, legally, I guess, I wasn't going to go to jail or anything, but I knew very well that the consequences would be severe. I would more than likely lose all my friends and family, which is exactly what happened. Watchtower may say we believe people have the right to do so, but they don't think a person should ever leave, and they will punish members who do. It's not as simple as not becoming a Jehovah's Witness, and it should be noted that many people raised in the religion who don't get baptized try to do that, but they're still subjected to shunning by their families. Jehovah's Witnesses warn against bad association constantly, and that can refer to your own children. Watchtower reasons that a person raised as a witness knows it's the truth, and if one knows it's the truth but doesn't get baptized, culturally, that's just as bad as being disfellowshipped. And some parents choose to treat their kid that way. And if any legal entities or reporters watching this video want examples, I have dozens of them I can happily provide. So, to recap, no, Watchtower does not give its members informed consent prior to baptism. The mature individuals they baptize are often young children who have been raised in a closed community. Repenting often isn't enough to avoid disfellowshipping, and critically, even if a member just wants to quietly resign because of conscientious disagreements, the punishment is the same as it is for some guy who cheated on his wife or murdered someone. The congregation only hears so-and-so is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I want to reiterate that point because it speaks to the terrifying social consequences foisted upon every member of the religion. Whether you're disfellowshipped or choose to resign, the members of a congregation will be given zero details or distinction. They have no idea if the 17-year-old girl who's announced as no longer being a Jehovah's Witness was disfellowshipped because of committing a crime, was falsely blamed for her own rape by a patriarchal system, or because she posted some TikToks making fun of the governing body. All of these things can potentially result in the same consequences, shunning and ostracization. There is no middle ground within Jehovah's Witnesses, a fact they reiterate often. Depend on Jehovah's word for direction. No matter what the issue is, obedience to Jehovah and his laws are vital. There is no middle ground. Either you are obedient or you are not. Let's look at the next claim Watchtower makes, which is that disfellowshipping is based on Bible principles. And this is actually a pretty easy one to cover for our purposes here in this video. Given that this is a document to inform governments and lawmakers of their practice, I can understand why they get into this. They want to explain the theological reason behind it all. But I also think it's important to understand why, from a legal standpoint, it doesn't really matter. Because the Bible told me so is not a legal defense, and courts are, in theory, not supposed to regard one religion's interpretation of a religious text above another's. Scientology also shuns former members, and I have to imagine we follow the principles of L. Ron Hubbard would not be a sufficient defense to a court 
state or civil litigant. The thing states would ostensibly be trying to prove is whether or not a religious practice is harmful. It's not the government's role to determine whether or not a religious entity is applying scriptures correctly. I want to mention this because it's one of the main defenses members of the religion watching this video will likely jump to. But for the intended audience of the document, lawyers, judges, governmental organizations, it doesn't really matter. It's also what one might call an unfalsifiable claim, something a person can't possibly prove as true or false. As an extreme example, David Koresh claimed to be something like the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And that's not something we can actually disprove by any scientific metric. You could use the Bible to argue why it's likely false, but Koresh might counter, I'm the guy who caused the Bible to be written in the first place, you can trust me. Many Christian religions disagree with the notion that disfellowshipping is biblical. But nobody can prove that it's not biblical because the Bible is open to interpretation. If it wasn't, we wouldn't have so many religions. So I'm not going to get bogged down in this particular aspect of the organization's argument. Therefore, let us retreat back to the provably false claims, otherwise known as lies. And Watchtower claims that shunning is not mandatory, but rather that each individual member chooses to adjust or cease association with disfellowshipped or disassociated persons. Although most who were formerly Jehovah's Witnesses are individuals who have been disfellowshipped, some decided to disassociate themselves, resign of their own free will. Jehovah's Witnesses respect the right of each individual to make this decision to break with their former beliefs and associates. In like manner, disfellowshipped and disassociated persons should understand that their former fellow believers may choose to adjust or cease their contact with them based on their conscience. This isn't my main point, but there's some sneaky wording here that's easy to miss. This decision to break with their former beliefs and associates. Speaking for myself, though I did want to leave my religion, I didn't want to break with my associates. All my best friends were Jehovah's Witnesses, and most of the things that we bonded over had nothing to do with the religion itself. We nerded out about Star Wars, played D&D, and I would have loved to stop attending meetings but keep my friends. Here, Watchtower inadvertently reveals that they see an implicit connection between religion and relationship. Its members cannot have one without the other. But to get into the meat of Watchtower's argument, is it true that some members might choose to act differently than other members when it comes to interacting with disfellowship friends and family members? Sure, some may be laxer about shunning, some may be stricter, but Watchtower here implies that shunning does not even necessarily apply to family members. Within the family arrangement, while the religious ties the disfellowshipped or disassociated person had with his family change, blood ties remain, the marriage relationship, and normal family affections and dealings continue. This is, to be frank, a pretty abhorrent lie, one I'm eager to disprove. Watchtower is on trial, so to speak, not because of the choices of autonomous individuals, but because of their institutional policies and practices. So, how does this religious institution instruct its members to act when a person is disfellowshipped or chooses to leave via disassociation? Do I show zeal for pure worship? Do I stop associating with anyone, including a family member, who turns his back on Jehovah? They loved me and wanted me to come back to Jehovah. I tried to contact them. I just wanted to talk and to hear their voice. I missed being with my family. And they thought about reaching out to me. But they knew that if they had associated with me, even a little, just to check on me, that small dose of association might have satisfied me. I kept wondering how he was doing. Was he okay? Then, as hard as the past few weeks had been, it just got harder. I knew what the Bible said about quit mixing in company with anyone who is not living according to Christian standards. But I never thought that scripture would one day apply to me. Later that evening, a brother was talking about the example of Korah's sons. When the people were told to move away from the rebels' tents, what would Korah's sons do? Would they put loyalty to family ahead of loyalty to Jehovah? The Bible tells us that his sons remained loyal to Jehovah and were blessed for it. That night, after the meeting, I told Ben about the text I received from Levi. I told him everything. How I miss Levi so much, but 
that I also wanted to be loyal to Jehovah, like Cora's sons. Ben admitted that he too had been struggling with feelings like mine. But then he said something that I hadn't thought of. If we were to stand between Levi and the discipline he needs, we would in effect be blocking an expression of Jehovah's love from reaching him. There is no question as the Watchtower's position on shunning disfellowship or disassociated members. Jehovah's Witness leaders tell their members that their salvation and relationship with God is dependent on them shunning disfellowship family members, even ignoring their phone calls, texts, and emails. When experiences from members are mentioned, they make sure to reiterate how traumatic this should inevitably feel to them. Worse than death, even. Has one of your loved ones been disfellowshipped from the congregation? That can be heartbreaking. When my faithful spouse died after 41 years of marriage, says a sister named Hilda, I thought it was the worst thing I could ever experience. But when my son left the congregation, his wife and his children, it was far, far worse for me. And an apologist might argue, well, these are just dramatizations and experiences of individuals. But that apologist would be wrong. What we've just watched is considered, within the religion, spiritual food from Jehovah himself. Members are told that governing body members are appointed directly by Jesus. Jesus directly communicates through the governing body. But Jehovah and Jesus trust the imperfect slave who cares for things to the best of his ability and with the best of motives. Shouldn't we then trust the imperfect slave as well? Organizational videos, publications, books, they're not just media, they are God's way of feeding the flock. And does an individual have a choice to ignore this advice? Not according to the leadership, no. Ready to obey. Why? Because the obedience that we develop today will help us to obey life-saving instructions that we will receive from God's organization in the future. We will be protected as long as we are ready to obey. When that direction comes out to branch committee members or when it comes out to the congregations, if you want Jehovah's blessing on you as a, an individual or family, certainly as a elder or a congregation, it'd be best to just ask Jehovah to help you understand it, but obey the decision. An approved relationship with Jehovah is necessary to survive Armageddon and inherit everlasting life. The only way to have a relationship with God is to be an active Jehovah's Witness. But the language in this watchtower is critical. You can't just be a casual churchgoer. One must have an approved relationship with Jehovah. And if you don't obey organizational direction, your relationship will not be approved. For all intents and purposes, for Jehovah's Witnesses, these videos are from God. God is telling the members to shun their XJW family. We have an abundance of nourishing food, Bible-based publications, recordings and videos, meetings and conventions, website material. Jehovah has placed everything we need on the table. Do some individuals within Watchtower break the rules and continue to have a relationship anyway? Probably, sometimes. But the internal policy is clear, and witnesses will be frequently reminded to follow direction that they may not understand or agree with. The line about blood ties remaining is really pretty devious. It's actually a quote from an existing article, and the full context of it shows that this only applies to Jehovah's Witness family living in the same home together. Which means Watchtower has purposefully taken their own quote out of context in order to appear less extreme. By the way, it doesn't take much digging to find dozens upon dozens of testimonials from XJWs who were kicked out of their homes as minors for not wanting to be a witness anymore. Watchtower are using this quote in this document only to be deceitful. The authors of the document are writing the opposite of what Watchtower actually teaches and repeats to its members over and over. The line itself can only be said to be true in a strictly literal sense. Sure, your blood ties remain in the sense that you're legally and genetically still blood relatives, but in every other sense of the word, Watchtower firmly believes the opposite. One of their primary claims here is that shunning is normal, actually. People do it all the time. And they proceed to cite examples of worldly, individuals who decide to cut toxic people out of their lives or stop associating with a family member who's abusive, etc. But this comparison doesn't work because in Watchtower, it's not an individual choice. 
Someone who disobeys the organization in this matter might be labeled as stirring up divisions, not being peaceable or obedient, and can be socially ostracized. What these sorts of documents always fail to convey, and as we'll see, what apologetic scholars often fail to convey, is the intense social pressure to conform to the group at all times. Perhaps the thing being stressed by witness leadership these days is obedience at all costs. Millions believe in exactly the same based on the word about Christ. Some may say unity of belief, you're brainwashed. Well, we do agree that our thinking has been washed clean and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Think about how unique our unity is. We are also united internationally. Out in the world, look around. People are divided. Nations attack each other. And within nations, political parties fight one another. When we stand together and unitedly follow direction from Jehovah's organization, good things happen. Stand together as one united people. Obedience even when you don't understand what you're obeying or why. Even when there are not literal punishments handed down from the elders, there may well be social consequences for deviating from the group in matters such as this. For example, the Elders' Manual shows that a person's privileges in standing in the congregation can be called into question if they have too much association with disfellowshipped family members. Willful, continued, unnecessary association with disfellowshipped or disassociated non-relatives, despite repeated counsel, would warrant judicial action. If a publisher in the congregation is known to have unnecessary association with disfellowshipped or disassociated relatives who are not in the household, elders should use the scriptures to counsel and reason with him. Review with him information from the Remaining God's Love book, page 241. If it is clear that a Christian is violating the spirit of the disfellowshipping decree in this regard and does not respond to counsel, he would not qualify for congregation privileges, which require one to be exemplary. He would not be dealt with judicially unless there is persistent spiritual association or he persists in openly criticizing the disfellowshipping decisions. Even within the organization, members are warned not to get overly close to congregation members who are not in good standing. To summarize, it's clear from Watchtower's own internal materials that they see shunning as mandatory. And anyone who fails to follow the group's social guidelines may see themselves shunned or socially ostracized as well. Part 3. Speaking of Watchtower's internal materials, let's get to this brochure they've included. It's more or less an abbreviated version of this 800-page document, so we don't need to go through everything it says. We've actually basically covered it all already, but I want to note two things in particular about it. One is the cover, which I've showed a lot through this document. It depicts a happy, warm congregation in full color, and looking back forlornly as someone who is decidedly not included in the group. The disfellowship person is not getting hugs and smiles and love. It's sad. <laughs> it's a sad picture. The message is clearly, don't be disfellowshipped or you'll be left out of the love of the congregation like this lady. I don't know why they thought including this picture would make disfellowshipping look more palatable to outsiders, but I don't think it does, personally. Now, I'll concede that's an entirely nitpicky point. Uh, and my other criticism might appear nitpicky at first, but bear with me, this is actually really important. On the last page of this brochure, there's a section called Gratitude for the Arrangement, and it cites two examples from formerly disfellowshipped Jehovah's Witnesses, who later got reinstated, and say they appreciated the disfellowshipping arrangement. Let's read them quickly. I was disfellowshipped for approximately 17 years. During those 17 years, I experienced no pressure or opposition from Jehovah's Witnesses, including from my family members. On the contrary, the religious ministers, elders of the congregation I had attended when I was disfellowshipped, contacted me several times over the years to inquire about my well-being. In my view, they acted in a loving way. I speak for myself when I say that the loving affection of the Witnesses is the main reason why I decided to return. During the time I was disfellowshipped, I had limited contact with my family and friends in the congregation. Still, I knew that they loved me very much and that they did not condemn me. I knew that they were limiting their association out of respect for the Bible commandments that we had each chosen to live our lives by. When I put my life back in order, I was warmly welcomed by the congregation and was reinstated as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Although I had sad times when I was disfellowshipped, I am convinced from my personal experience that it is a loving and beneficial form of spiritual assistance 
and correction. So a couple nice statements from names have been changed. Names have been changed. There are 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide, and yet, for this supposedly loving arrangement that benefits millions of people, when Watchtower is trying to prove how loving this arrangement is, they can only conjure up two vague, brief statements from completely anonymous people. Why not put them on the record? Why not cite a source for the one thing they're trying to prove? That this is a practice understood and appreciated by its members. Well, if they did, I suppose someone might be able to, you know, check. A journalist might look up the person and ask if they were quoted accurately. Or maybe worse, the person they quoted might later leave for good and decide to revise their statement or retract it. In all these 837 pages, only two brief testimonies from previously disfellowshipped members of the religion are included, anonymously. And if this was overwhelmingly appreciated by the rank and file, you'd think Watchtower would be eager to demonstrate that. What it does have is a lot of quotes from alleged experts. For this final part, let's look at the scholarship. There are many choice quotes from scholars scattered throughout the document, and the majority of the 800 pages are reproductions of monographs, white pages, and academic essays. I'd like to start with examining the sources before we get into the specific claims made by those sources. Per the preface of this document, the purpose of citing these academics is to disprove some cliches and explain why the practice of disfellowshipping should be respected. So here are the academics Watchtower cites in their bibliography. And I'm just going to say, I apologize, I'm probably going to pronounce all these names wrong, uh, but I'm, I'm trying my best. One monograph from a PhD in Kazakhstan named Artur Artemiev. One article from Massimo Intravine's The Journal of Sesner. Five articles from a website called Bitter Winter, a website started by Massimo Intravine. One article from Massimo Intravine's The Journal of Sesner. Five articles from a website called Bitter Winter, a website started by Massimo Intravine. And one of the cited Bitter Winter articles was written by Massimo Intravene. One more monograph co-written and researched by Alessandro Amicarelli, and you guessed it, Massimo Intravene. And a scholarly article of sorts by a man named Yannick Teals, who is a contributor to various websites, including Bitter Winter, by Massimo Intravene. Quotes from Massimo pop up frequently throughout this document, and he's cited several times here in the bibliography. But he's not cited enough times, if you ask me. Bitter Winter, from which Watchtower cites five articles, is a website owned and operated by Massimo Intervene. Massimo is the founder of Sesner, and thus the oft-cited Journal of Sesner. Alessandro Micarelli, who is the co-author with Massimo on one of these monographs, is also a contributor to Sesner and Bitter Winter, as is Yannick Teals and Holly Folk, who has a few choice quotes scattered throughout. So, in macro, we really only have two sources from academia, in my estimation. Various Sesner-related articles, and one monograph from a man called Artur Artemiev, who wrote about Jehovah's Witnesses in Kazakhstan. Now, I don't expect Watchtower to seek out objective sources. Objectivity is a sticky word anyway, and it's perfectly reasonable that they would want to cite information from academics that is biased in their favor. The whole point of this document is to present the strongest possible case for shunning. But these academics such as they are, go a bit beyond being biased. Sesner, of which all except one cited expert is a member or contributor, is essentially a think tank for high control groups. From Wikipedia, Sesner has been described as the highest profile lobbying and information group for controversial religions. Sesner scholars have defended such diverse groups as the Unification Church, the Church of Scientology, the Order of the Solar Temple, responsible for 74 deaths in mass murder-suicide, and Shinshinonji Church of Jesus, I definitely didn't pronounce that right, accused of having aided the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic in South Korea. And in that illustrious company, they often defend Jehovah's Witnesses. Sesner describes its work as being against anti-cult movements. And that's interesting wording, because the opposite of being anti-cult would be pro. Hmm. Massimo has written expert opinions where Watchtower might have to pay compensatory damages to the victims of child sex abuse within the religion. And he can even be found in a video on Jehovah's Witnesses' official website, jw.org. However, uh, religious liberty is something fragile, and definitions of extremism may easily be used against groups who are somewhat unpopular. Actually, several of the people cited as sources have appeared on Jehovah's Witnesses' official website to defend the organization. One of the Bitter Winter articles cited is from James Richardson, who is quoted here, defending the organization in glowing terms. Ditto for Willy Foutra, and here's another cited Bitter Winter author, George Chrysidis, granting an exclusive interview to JW.org, alongside Gerhard Bessier, who's also cited by Watchtower as a primary source in this shunning document. It's unclear how Sesner is funded, 
It is listed as a nonprofit, though members can contribute, and the members are not listed publicly. But it should be noted that the think tank is not above presenting members of the controversial religions it lobbies for as unbiased scholars. Cessner again met with controversy when one of the scheduled speakers at the 1997 Cessner Conference who was to present scholarship on the religious group New Acropolis, was discovered to be a member of the very group she purported to study. Now, I don't think that's happened here. I would actually be surprised to find any Jehovah's Witnesses working in academia, given the organization's stance on higher education. But we should be careful about trusting an organization that exists solely to defend demonstrably dangerous groups, uncritically commiserates and collaborates with said groups, and has a history of, you know, Lying. Let's look at some of the claims made by these Cessner experts throughout the document. First is the man himself, Massimo Intervene. By defending the right of their judicial committees to remain free from state interference when they decide whether a member should be disfellowshipped or otherwise, and their right to interpret the Bible in the sense that it mandates shunning those who had been disfellowshipped, the Jehovah's Witnesses are, once again, defending the religious liberty of all precisely in the area where today it is mostly under attack. Of course, as we covered earlier, Watchtower actively prays for the destruction of every religion other than their own. Any defense of other religions via the court systems is purely by accident. But Massimo's argument is incredibly thin. There is no inherent virtue in defending the right of a judicial committee to remain free from state interference if judicial committees consistently cause harm, and they demonstrably do. These are closed-door sessions with no recordings allowed where three men have the opportunity to, say, interrogate a woman about very personal, traumatic sexual details. Historically, rape victims have been re-traumatized by having to recount their harrowing experience to a room full of men, all with the possibility of being disfellowshipped for sexual immorality, thereby being punished and ostracized from their own community for their own sexual assault. Religions should have freedom, of course, but not absolute freedom to do whatever harmful things they want, hiding behind the name of God to shield themselves from consequences. If an organized group systematically and routinely damages the lives of others, why should the courts be obligated to let them do so? Religious freedoms should also mean freedom to change religions, freedom for religious individuals. This is not that. Instead, Massimo here extols Watchtower's strides in defending the freedom for religions to infringe upon the freedom of its members. Let's move on to the next statement from one of Massimo's buddies, this time Dr. Alessandro Amicarelli. The state should accept the right of such communities to react in accordance with their own rules and interests to any dissent movement emerging within them that might pose a threat to their cohesion, image, or unity. It is perfectly legitimate and permitted basing on the human rights standard. The human rights standard, what is that exactly? Well, I couldn't find anything called the human rights standard on the internet, but the United Nations does have a universal declaration of human rights, which is pretty close, and Article 12 says, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to attacks upon his honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks. And Article 1 says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act toward one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Now, some would say a mother being mandated by her religious leaders to shun her own son, for example, constitutes interference with one's family or home. And labeling former members as apostates who are mentally diseased puppets being controlled by Satan, the evil puppeteer. Evil ventriloquist. Well, some might consider that an attack on one's honor and reputation. And it doesn't sound particularly brotherly to me. Not to mention, once again, Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to use their reason and conscience if it happens to contradict the leadership's reason and conscience, lest they get shunned as well. So when Alessandro goes on to say in his white paper that Jehovah's Witnesses suggest that current members do not associate with disfellowshipped ex-members, an exception, however, is made for members of the immediate family, he's lying. Then again, Watchtower teaches that the United Nations is a biblically foretold satanic entity that will be destroyed by Jehovah during Armageddon, so maybe they don't care much for the universal declaration of human rights. Let's look at a claim in this document from Holly Folk, another Cessner acolyte. She says, some former members have chosen to monetize their status as former members, and it is entirely reasonable for the Jehovah's Witnesses, like any other faith tradition in that situation, to want to have no contact with these people who are basically professional critics of the religion. Now, obviously, I have to state my bias here as somebody who has left the religion and has a monetized YouTube channel. But, um, 
What's Holly Folk's job again? She's monetized her status as a professional apologist for fringe religious groups, and Watchtower monetizes its status as a religion. Members are asked to pledge a certain amount of money per month to donate to the organization. They're reminded that any money they have technically was given to them by God, so it's only right to give as much of it back to him as possible. Millions of dollars are required each month to finance the colossal kingdom work that is being supported by this organization in some 239 lands. They even make kids cartoons about how Jehovah's Witness children should give their allowance to the organization. And the leadership lives in a beautiful lakeside compound in upstate New York where every meal is free, prepared by hand by their subordinates. They have no expenses, they get free medical care, they get to travel around the world on the membership's time and do fun little dances or whatever is happening here. So why are religious leaders allowed to make money building a religion, and apologists are allowed to make money defending a religion, but critics aren't allowed to make money criticizing the religion? That's an interesting standard, one that Holly Folk and the Cessner contingent has also made for Scientology. And you know, in a vacuum, I kind of agree with Holly. I wouldn't have an issue with her argument if it really was a choice. I know I sound like a broken record here, but members aren't given a choice as to whether or not to obey organizational direction. And ironically, if Jehovah's Witnesses didn't hang the threat of shunning over its members, I kind of doubt that any professional critics of the religion would exist. Now what about the one article that didn't come from Massimo Introvene and his buddies? I'm going to reiterate before I read this. This is not something written by Watchtower. This is written by someone calling himself an academic. A person who comes across Jehovah's Witnesses for the first time is usually very surprised by the fact that their teachings are very different from the teachings of other churches. It surprises people even more when, in answer to questions about the reasons for such beliefs, they do not hear something like, because that's just how it is, but instead get a detailed response based on simple logic and Bible texts. There is no choice but to be surprised, because we have to admit that most religious people are not very familiar with the teachings of their own church. They cannot explain the reasons for or the symbolic meaning of their rituals and celebrations. Usually, all teachings are accepted without any basis, just because everyone's doing so or the priest knows better. Jehovah's Witnesses are different. Every one of them knows why he believes one thing and not another. Moreover, their teachings do not contain dogmas or traditions, and this fact affects their mindset and their view of the world. I wonder if you ever asked the witness why they don't allow beards. This is an astonishingly unacademic series of statements. How can this man, in his capacity as a scholar, make the claim that a person who comes across Jehovah's Witnesses for the first time is usually very surprised by their unique teachings? Or that a person will be even more surprised by hearing that Jehovah's Witnesses can generally explain their beliefs. How does one measure such claims? What data is this person using to determine that there is no choice to agree with him? Because we have to admit that most religious people are not familiar with the teachings of their own church, let alone the dogmatic statement that religious people, just religious people, generally billions of religious people around the globe, cannot explain these things. and usually accept all teachings without any basis. I've tried to temper my criticism throughout this video, but this is an insult to the very notion of scholarship and would be dismissed outright by a high school English teacher, let alone a professor. These are the sorts of broad, baseless, many people are saying type claims one would expect from a grifting politician or religious leader. This is not scholarship, it's hagiography thinly veiled apologia disguised as a scholarly dissertation. And this is but one paragraph of this comically anti-intellectual propaganda piece. Just for fun, let's look at the very first page of Artemyev's work included in the shunning document, Jehovah's Witnesses in Kazakhstan. He states in his typically condescending, grandiose fashion, Jehovah's Witnesses did not come to Kazakhstan in the 1990s that some experts are trying to prove. I am not afraid to say that they have been a part of the history of our country and our society for the past 100 years. Well, he should be afraid to say that, because it's wrong and silly. Also, I decided to give him that accent for fun. Now, I don't know who these supposed experts are that he's so upset about. I guess we'll just have to trust him, bro. The earliest reference found to Kazakhstan at all on their official database isn't until 1965, but one expert who contradicts this 100-year claim of his is Watchtower itself. 
Its publications state that Jehovah's Witnesses came to Kazakhstan, albeit against their will, in 1955. I'm going to be honest, I, I got a little obsessed with this Artemyev guy. Th this last point wasn't even that important. I just wanted you to see how intellectually bankrupt Watchtower's key witness was, but I'm afraid I've saved the worst for last. This quote from Dr. Artemyev is displayed in large letters in the shunning brochure included in the document. It says, It is worth noting that disfellowshipping does not cancel family relations, as some dishonest journalists and cult experts sometimes try to claim. Setting aside the very scholarly, every journalist and expert who disagrees with me is dishonest language. It's not cult experts and journalists making these claims, it's Watchtower. As we've shown time and time again in this video, Watchtower produces countless videos and articles that make clear to the members that XJW family members are to be shot. And any self-proclaimed academic dismissively arguing the contrary can only do so by expressly ignoring the content Watchtower itself creates. I've tried to make as few claims of my own as possible in this video. Instead, I've tried to show the claims Watchtower is making in this document and putting them side by side with the statements they make outside of this document in other articles and videos. But I'll say this with my full chest. An honest person studying witness publications in good faith could not reasonably come to the conclusion that disfellowshipping has a negligible effect on family relationships, is purely a matter of personal choice, and that baptized members are given fully informed consent. You don't need to listen to critics, apostates, journalists, anyone to reach this conclusion. All you need to do is watch Watchtower's videos and read their publications, because they uniformly contradict many of the claims they make in this document. Don't believe what Watchtower says they believe when trying to look their best. Look at their belief system for yourself. An interesting thing about this document is that it is not on Jehovah's Witnesses official website, jw.org, which means this is not something Watchtower wants its members to see. Not even elders who are used to getting confidential letters and books that other people in the congregation can't access. No, this is something Watchtower wanted to keep secret. And why would that be? You know, this is supposed to be just a compilation of things they objectively believe, right? All the clips and articles I showed are directly from JW.org. Even the pretty unflattering stuff, to their credit, is on their website. And if this document is only a succinct breakdown of what JWs actually believe, why wouldn't Watchtower want its members to see this? It's not like they don't post about court cases involving their organization. They do that all the time in the news section of their website. No, it's not on the website because it contradicts everything on their website. The references it makes to articles and publications available are often out of context, which is easy to see if you check their work. But Watchtower is hoping you don't. They're hoping you think, why would we lie about our own religious beliefs? To put it simply, every Jehovah's Witness would know that what this document says is a lie. Watchtower doesn't want its members to see this because it doesn't want its members to see that the leadership lies about their beliefs to courts, governments, and other officials. If the leadership was honest about what they believed, they would have to admit that they do actively encourage families to shun XJW family members. They do baptize very young children who are incapable of understanding the consequences. They do not have respected scholars on their side, which is why the only ones they can provide are shills who are seemingly bought and paid for by the likes of Watchtower, Scientology, and the Moonies. Watchtower doesn't want to be honest about the way it presents its leaders as the only channel God he uses today. So every comment it makes about shunning is not a mere suggestion, but a mandate from Jehovah God. And they sure as heck don't want the court system to know that Watchtower wants to see them destroyed, that they are part of this corrupt political system of Satan's that's going to be destroyed. May they soon be executed. If you've seen the document, you probably noticed that there's one section I haven't talked about at all, and that's the final section. Many pages of Watchtower's legal victories in upholding their disfellowshipping practice. And I didn't get into this because mostly people much more qualified than myself have already gone through these cases in a lot of detail, but also, you know, I don't agree with the court's rulings. Just because something has legal precedent doesn't mean that it is morally correct or undeserving of reconsideration. The excuse that some courts have agreed that our shunning practice is perfectly legal so you should agree too, it just doesn't work for me. I think we have a responsibility to make sure that any freedoms, from speech to self-protection to religion, are not abused. In the United States, we have free speech, but hate speech is still a crime. Freedom of speech does not mean freedom to cause harm without consequence. And so, while we have freedom of religion in the United States, I would argue that we have a similar moral imperative to ensure that religions don't cause harm without consequence, and are not given tax-exempt status or government funding to proliferate that harm. And just because such a thing might be difficult to regulate doesn't mean we shouldn't try. The authorities in Norway have threatened to remove our legal registration 
because of our scriptural beliefs and practices regarding disfellowshipping. In the future, various governments will challenge our freedom of worship. They may pressure us to change our scriptural beliefs, but we're certainly not going to do that. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. This video obviously took a long time to research and write, and I want to give a special shout out to several XJW activists who helped immensely. Jan Fru Nielsen, who leaked the document and gave me a great deal of context and documentation, uh, which really helped me understand this document and Watchtower situation in Norway. Mark O'Donnell uh, was incredibly helpful in just every aspect of this. And a very special thanks to Cam, Lil, Samantha, Anna Lacey, Ron the Pimo, My Little Pimo, Cory Dax, and many others. I, I, I know I'm forgetting a lot of people, but so many people in my Discord helped me do a ridiculous amount of research and helped me verbalize a lot of the logical fallacies present in the document. One of the things we've been trying to do is figure out ways to organize more IRL activism regarding Jehovah's Witnesses. So one of the things that would be really helpful is if you could spread this video around and if nothing else, alert local journalists uh, who might write these fluff pieces you see in the newspaper about Jehovah's Witnesses. Alert them to the actual practices and policies. You know, link them to some of these videos that I showed. You know, link them that really cringy shunning video about the woman who was, you know, so happy that her parents didn't text her back. Thank you so much to everyone who helped, and thanks for listening.